Hi, everyone. Welcome to the presentation of six meetings for success. My name is Stephanie Subcheck. I'm a project manager at UW Health in Madison, Wisconsin. And I'm going to share with you um, kind of a, a combining of different tools that I've found over the years really helps kind of position a, a team to do an efficient improvement project. So in my role and in past roles, I have led a lot of improvement teams and not all of them very successful. And so I kept seeing and noticing the same kind of pattern, which is we would get together as a team and we'd, we'd brainstorm, we'd find root causes and plan. And then as soon as you would try to put it into practice on a unit or in a department, it would fall off the cliff and fall apart. And then people would really get stuck and not know how to move forward. So after a lot of struggling teams, um, I really started thinking about what is it that goes awry? And I came up with a lot of different types of causes. So some of the common missteps that really can slow your improvement is one of, one of them is just a really loose adherence to some sort of defined improvement process. People might be able to speak to PDCA or PDSA, but they really don't have the experience to actually do it. And that can be true of any sort of improvement model that you may have in place. Meetings, just in time scheduling of meetings, people who can't show to meetings, um, rescheduling because things got busy, that was really slowing down the efforts as well. Meeting time spent discussing personalities versus the process. Now, what I mean by that is sometimes we can get hung up on the conversation of, oh, Dr. Smith is never go, gonna go for this change, you know, what are we gonna do about that? Versus, you know, really just focusing on what are the changes we need to make. Another thing is being okay with improvements taking 9, 12, 18 months to implement, no matter how small. Um, and I think we can maybe do things with a little better sense of urgency. Uh, also a willingness to kind of drop the ball on tasks, you know, everybody's busy, couldn't get to it, didn't get to it the next time you asked me. So that kind of thing can, can kind of creep into a culture. And then lastly, kind of a failure to connect the improvement to the frontline staff, um, involving those folks early and often. So we're not surprising them with this new checklist that you need to start using next Tuesday, right? So there are a lot of mistakes made over the years and I've made many of these. So in looking at how to do things better, um, I pulled together an idea of having six meetings, standardized meetings, to help a team get a really good start on an improvement process. So I'm gonna to cut to the chase here. What, are, what is this about? It's really about being grounded in whatever standardized approach to involvement that your organization uses. You might use the model for improvement from IHI. You might use Focus PDCA. You might use DMAIC, doesn't really matter, but you do wanna ground everything in that model. The next thing, uh, being willing to use a set of predefined agendas for each meeting so that we're not thinking about guessing what the next meeting is going to be like. We're already going to know. Having stakeholders committing to doing the work between meetings. So our meetings are really to tee up the work we need to do until the next meeting. And that's a little bit of a different mindset. Having the discipline to document and actively manage action items that come out of each meeting. Also, uh, I'll teach you a tool how to plan small tests of change to gradually introduce a change into an operational area. And then also having some idea of following up so that we don't backslide on the improvement that we made. Okay, a couple of mindset shifts. First thing is we have to get people used to the idea that this is not where improvement happens. It doesn't happen in your meetings. It can't happen in your meetings. Your meetings are for planning, teeing up, having discussions. But I'll tell you, unless you get to improvement where the patients are, no matter what setting, those improvements have to take place in our care settings or they're just not gonna stick. So that's a really big mindset is shifting a good chunk of the work outside of a meeting context and getting involved where the work is done. So the method is a base framework of six one-hour meetings. 
the one hour meetings have really defined deliverables from each one. And our goal is to work through defining the problem, finding the root cause and picking a solution relatively quickly. The key thing again, for people who are participating in this, they have to commit to completing their action items on time. And we try to really make the action items bite-sized enough so that that can happen. But the heart and soul of the method is really engaging those who do the work in the place where they work, right? Our frontline are our experts and they are going to be the ones to tell us very early if what we believe might work well is or is not going to work well. So this approach has been used in a number of different settings for different purposes. I've used it to implement some elements of clinical bundles. I've used it to do better cross-functional coordination, such as implementing a discharge checklist or working with pharmacy on med, med reconciliation uh, process challenges, ordering wound vacs, uh, gaps in supply stocking, things that are kind of rocks in our shoes that we tend to have to deal with on a regular basis, and closing handoff issues, um, ED to inpatient admissions, uh, always a popular uh, challenge, and then uh, used it for clinic triage in a cardiology clinic. So it just gives you an idea of how you can apply it. The key thing is that that improvement you're working on has a very defined scope you kind of know where you want to get to by the end of the improvement process. So here is the meeting structure. We want to schedule all six meetings in advance. And you see they are titled uh, stakeholder meeting, action planning, small test design, progress check, implementation planning, and implementation follow-up. Now, the thing about the meeting cadence here is we don't use a standard meet every week kind of cadence. This is an example of something that's fairly typical. We front load the work by meeting pretty frequently for meeting one, two, and three. But when we get to implementing small tests, checking up on those, working toward implementation planning, that just takes longer and we know it takes longer. So why meet on a weekly cadence when there isn't gonna be anything to really talk about? Let's just split it out. We know this end of the process takes more time, so we're going to schedule that way. So, you know, whatever works in, in the context of the improvement, this is a pretty typical cadence that I've run into, um, but varying the time that's needed between meetings. And we're just looking at completing the tasks that we are aiming to complete in that span of time. So we use the six meetings very wisely. I'm gonna take you through uh, kind of the standard agenda and then to focus a little bit on the tasks that come out of each meeting. So for our stakeholder meeting, this is where we introduce the team. We will talk about what the purpose is. We may do some data sharing and we're gonna use that to really identify specific root causes and gaps. A lot of times that first meeting, you kind of find the, uh, the slate of just do it items. Um, so we'll just put those into action items and get her done. Um, the other piece of this is the task piece. So when we are initially going through this, we want to use our gaps that we've identified and run them by other people. So confirm the gaps with other people and gather any input on opportunities for improvement. The third thing we're doing is kind of assessing a readiness to change. Not every area uh, ha is ready to change at the same pace. So we wanna really keep an eye out for someone who might be willing to step up to the plate first. And then we will integrate the improvement methods. So on our second meeting, we'll just do a quick report out to hear what the input was. And then we're gonna make two lists. We're gonna find out which is our low hanging fruit and which should be developed for test to change. We're gonna identify who we need to invite to the third meeting who are going to be intimately involved in the planning of the change and carrying out tests. So another tip is to you know, use your planning tool if it's an A3 format or a PDSA tool, but fill that out outside of the meeting. I find sometimes we get really bogged down in a meeting by trying to fill out that tool. Uh, that can be done in between and then bring it back for feedback. Um, you want to discuss planning ideas with others and then start thinking about who your testing volunteers might be. 
The third meeting is your small test of change design. So we're confirming what change we wanna test. We're gonna design our testing phases. And then that's the big deliverable for the next meeting is we're gonna ensure that our frontline is involved in some very small scale tests and to really use informal feedback to find out how those tests are going and what we're learning at each cycle and grow the testing pool from there. The fourth meeting is a progress check meeting. This is where we're going to review how those initial tests went, get a report out from our testers, and then as a, as a group, make a consensus decision. Are we going to continue testing cycles? Uh, has it gone just very well and we can move to implementation? Or if we are stalling out, meeting four is when you call in the leaders and have a nice discussion about, is this the right time to even try this improvement? Invariably, this is the point in time when things start to fall apart. So I'd like to really highlight meeting four as one where you're making a really important decision. So the continuation of this from that critical step is to decide what you're gonna do. If you continue testing, you wanna to continue to incorporate test cycles. And so we're gonna be discussing the barriers we're running into and what we're learning. The fifth meeting is implementation planning. So again, this might take two, three, four weeks later, um, but we're gonna let those test cycles percolate. Then what we're gonna do is bring the group back and we're gonna discuss how do we wanna implement. What's our measurement tool? Do we need to put in an audit process? What's the oversight? And what are the accountabilities for those next phases? We're then going to really have an idea toward sustainment. How do we ensure that this thing is gonna stick? So we wanna carry out our implementation plan according to the, the developed plan steps that we have in place. Excuse me about that. Um, and we're really gonna talk about sharing this work with others so that after another period of time, a lot of times it's a month or so, um, we're gonna find out how the implementation is going. We're gonna talk about plan to close gaps. We're gonna confirm the ownership and most importantly, who's accountable for monitoring the outcomes over time. So that's that. That is the six meetings and the set agenda. So there's a few key tools um, that is available to you as well that I've shared um, that you can utilize and modify. Um, the first one is an implementation guide with a series of checklists for each meeting. So it's a really nice set of training wheels for just starting this out. I highly recommend looking at those checklists and kind of helping that shape how you're following or putting these meetings together. I'm gonna to teach you about an outcome-based agenda format. That's a really key tool to moving the work forward in these meetings. Um, you need an A3 or some sort of standard format to document the work. You need to use a root cause analysis tool, whether you do a simple five whys or you do a cause and effect diagramming, any tool that you wanna use, but you really need one of those. We're gonna also talk about a small test, of small test of change design and planning tool, which is also shared with you. And then the sixth key tool is to really be attentive to change tolerance. You know, find those folks who are willing to give something a try and like I like to say, engage the engaged. So the implementation guide looks like this. Um, and on the right here is one of the checklists for the stakeholders meeting. So there's some tasks for a facilitator, there's tasks for a senior leader, and I do recommend engaging a senior leader um, in the work. They don't need to come to every meeting, but they need to know that there's progress being made. And then what the agenda components are and some typical action items. So first tool, outcome-based agendas. This might look like a typical agenda, but it does have a couple of tweaks that can really make a difference in getting movement out of your meetings. First thing you might notice that may be a little different is we're not only denoting start time, but we wanna be very clear on how much time is used for each topic. We wanna ensure that our topics have enough detail so that you could ask anyone in the hallway to read that topic and they understand what you're talking about. In other words, no one word topics like communication doesn't mean anything, right? So we wanna spell that out a bit. Then also be sure you have involvement. 
Um, a hallmark of a meeting that's not gonna be great is the same darn name after each topic, right? You wanna involve a lot of different people that builds engagement and it builds the stakeholders in the process. Now, the outcome column is pretty important because for each topic, we ought to be able to note why that topic is on the agenda and what are we gonna get by the end of that meeting of putting that topic on the agenda. This isn't something we often do, but I'll tell you, it can be really essential for moving work ahead. Tied with that outcome is the process. So the process describes in a set of steps how that topic will be approached. So it's going to let people know before they even get to the meeting exactly what they're going to be asked to do. And then we always bookend our meetings with the action item at the end. Ask for a quick report out, make sure the action items that people talked about are being captured and you have an idea of who's owning it going forward. So by adding a couple of columns and really tying this across horizontally, um, the difference can be really significant. Um, documenting your progress, mention that any kind of tool you use, um, currently I use this, this find or find focus PDCA type of template in an A3 format. Doesn't matter what it is, but I find when you can be transparent about where a team is at, I like to actually post this on the unit so people can see the progress. They're not surprised when we get to actually implementing some changes. And then the next step is to go into a case study so that you can kind of see how this all works together. This was a, um, a case that I actually worked on last summer. This was a problem with handoffs between a residential care facility for people with intellectual disability, the EMS service and the hospital ED. So the patients that come into the ED are typically non-communicative. Um, there is a wide variation in the type of caregiver presence that comes along with the patient. Sometimes these folks don't even know anything about the patient. We had two near-miss safety events within 30 days. And so that really heightened awareness that we have to do something differently for this patient population. Um, our nursing education team had implemented a blue folder, a one-page intake form brought with the patient from skilled nursing facilities in the area which really showed some promise. So the thinking was maybe we have a red folder for this particular um, uh, care facility. Uh, but what the team discovered is the blue folder compliance wasn't great after implementation. And how many times do we run into that? So the team needs to explore some options for closing the gaps. First of all, you wanna really get a good idea of who the stakeholders are. And I find doing a diagram or a depiction of who stakeholders are is super helpful. Um, it's often a lot more people than we think. It's certainly more people than tend to get um, invited to our improvement meetings. So you can see here that the scope of this uh, is 36 RNs, 12 ED techs. We got a manager and four supervisors. We've got residents, nursing education. You can just see the whole gamut of stakeholders that will be involved in this process. So when we have meeting one, you can get an idea here of who we've invited. We have a, a champion for the team, which is a, from the coordinated care department. We got our nurse manager, our ed specialist, our inpatient ED director, EDRN, project manager, and then some coordinated care folks and the social workers. So that's the team that we start out with. Here is the outcome-based agenda that we're going to use. Um, this is kind of sharing the data it is one big piece of this meeting as well as building um, a cause and effect diagram. So we wanna confirm those root causes. We leave that meeting with a whole bunch of action items, but they're small. They're not too big of a lift or too big of an ask. So we wanna whiteboard with ED staff and confirm those root causes. We're gonna shadow maybe a couple people, learn, learn the process. There are a lot of different things and you can see the whole team is involved. So that's the scope we're talking about when we're talking about an action item, very bite-sized. So the team out of the first meeting 
did do a cause and effect diagram. And so we have the classic fishbone diagram here where you've noticed some markings on it. Um, one is an X through items that the team really does not have any control over. So we're not gonna react to those. But we do wanna circle things the team does have some um, indication that they can affect. And so that's what the green circles are. Those green circles really kind of translate to some potential root causes that we wanna vet with other groups. So the, after our meeting one, we take this around and really find out if we're hitting the mark here. We go into meeting two and we talk about, you know, what can't be changed. We're confirming that, we're confirming what we can do. Uh, there might be some data sharing, um, but what we're gonna do is record the gaps that we've found, identify low hanging fruit, and then identify small tests of change. So in this meeting two, we're really kind of carrying forward some early plans about what we're thinking of doing. And so we're asking people to kind of take those action items and dialogue with others. You can go to department huddles, you might meet with some frontline folks one-on-one, -on -one, but you need to have some sort of feedback loop to bring back to the team meeting. And that's all we're asking about. Really just want to get the word out there and to make sure that we're not, you know, stuck in groupthink, that we're really understanding the issue. We go right into meeting three here. And in meeting three, we're going to confirm what are the process changes that we need to test. So we're going to come to agreement on exactly what we're going to be doing and who's going to be doing it. So we want to complete a small test of change plan. I'll show you the format here. This plan um, is something I've developed over a period of years because this is where <laughs> the teams tend to fall off the cliff, right? So we're getting super specific. Our initiative is to improve the intake from this facility and we're gonna test a shared intake form. We know that our, our ED has 36 RNs. Um, we know that the smallest unit of change is one patient to one RN. And so for any RN with a scope, with a transfer from residential care, we want them to have an opportunity to test this shared intake form. And we have a pretty good sense that if we have about a third of the nurses be involved in the testing, that should give us a really good idea if this can be adopted. So that test description, test plan, and testers is really specific as to how exactly we're asking people to be involved in this. So they're starting with just a phone contact to kind of test it. Um, we're gonna do a couple of these red folders on a you know, small period of time. And then our third rot rotation of testing will be to implement on a different time of day. And you can see we're working through expanding our testing group as we go. So this is crucial. It's engaging the engaged. I mentioned that earlier. So in any group of people, you know that you're gonna have uh, an adoption curve. We always have folks who are really on the front end. They're just raring to go, wanna put things in place. Um, you want to know who those folks are. You also know that you're going to have some folks that are going to ride the fence for a bit or really, you know, tend to be kind of, you know, folded arms and going to wait and see before they do anything. Well, identify who the early adopters are. The other group to know of is who are your well-connected people that are very influential in any group. We already kind of know who these folks are, right? Um, but in my experience, if you don't involve them early, it tends to kind of fall apart over time. So figure out who your influence are, figure out who your early adopters are, and then engage them in the testing of the change. So in meeting number four, we are bringing back the results of that three cycle test to kind of report on what the status has been understand if the decision there is to adapt, adopt, or abandon. So if something didn't work at all, it's perfectly fine to abandon it. A um, lot of times we kind of find a tweak. If things are going well, then keep in mind how many nurses we identify that need to be involved. We wanna continue our testing till we've hit that mark of 12 RNs. So here's how it looks um, going forward from that. Each time we've learned something, we've made an adaptation and we've continued with the testing. 
Um, so we're continuing to receive that folder and we are just continuing to work through our cycles of testing. This is another nice tool to post. Uh, doesn't have to be pretty, you can do it in pencil, but so people see who's involved, what they're testing, it's not a big secret. In our meeting five, um, you can see in this case, it's 15 days later, we have um, the opportunity to look at an implementation checklist. So implementation is very different than testing a change. Implementation is really with an eye toward the future. And how are we going to get approvals to make this change, to build it into our education, all of those things that need to happen. Uh, here in this case, we had to go to a nursing council presentation to determine an, you know, who could be a champion of the implementation plan. And just to show, um, this is a nice little implementation checklist that we know we're getting close to implementing when the tested process is stable, okay? It hasn't changed because of high census. It hasn't changed because the holiday came along or it's a weekend. We've tested it in all those different situations and it's stable. We're not making any more test tests. We know we're ready to train others. And so we need to figure out how we're gonna train others, plan for that. Um, this is where your nursing ED or educators are really important to be part of it. Double check on policies, procedures, work instructions, all of those things are accounted for. If any changes need to be made, you account for that. We've got leadership support for formally adopting the change, and we know who's accountable for sustaining results going forward. So for our meeting six, this is really where we're going to ensure that the change is sticking that we've identified how that test is going to stay. So we are looking at our A3 and we're finishing it off with an audit plan. We've decided audit is the way to go. Um, we're gonna confirm what those process measure threshold, thresholds are and identify what are the triggers for us to revisit. This next step is available at the bottom of the small test of change form. So by the time we've worked through that test of change in our six meetings, we know who's the accountable person, what are they monitoring, who is going to see the data from that audit, how the data is going to be collected, what's the frequency, and then this is really key, what's the trigger for process review? So if we drop below 80% of these admissions from this facility, we know that the process is starting to degrade, so we need to get back on it again. This is the completed A3 for this project. Um, we've got a documented outcome. We've got a process map here. We've got our fishbone diagram. We put together an education plan and how we put that in place. There were some other changes in the EMR that we looked for, did a kind of a hard stop. So you can do parallel testing of changes, of course. And then we have this plan. We know that we're gonna have a monthly audit with an education trigger, uh, and we're gonna revisit this process twice annually. So this is the result of a six meeting format. We've gotten through everything and put together a pretty nice finished product at the end. So why does it work? Well, a couple things to keep in mind. Number one is your team isn't sort of a club, right? The group membership needs to be flexible. You don't have to invite the same people to every single meeting. Sometimes people, you know, don't have a role and they can float off. Sometimes we need to have the supervisors now attend the meeting because we're going to be talking about working with their staff. Maybe we don't have education come to every single one, but maybe when we're talking about implementation, we certainly do. So it's really, I think, uh, easier too to recruit participants for a very defined length of time. Like we need you to come to these two meetings versus would you be on an improvement team? And by the way, we have no idea how long this is gonna last. Uh, the, the willingness to be part of it really is improved. Um, it's important to actively discuss with others the work of the team. Way uh, less focus on filling out documents. Just do it on the side, um, bring it forward for review, but don't spend time in a meeting. I find too with the six meetings, the progress is steady enough so you don't lose people. 
They don't lose interest. They don't get frustrated or bored, okay? The front line is in the loop from the beginning and that really results in less resistance down the road. And actually you get really clear, crystal clear expectations for accountability. Um, you have your leader involved, they're in the loop, they're not in every meeting, but they understand the six meeting process and they understand where things are. And this is really an antidote to the things we tend to do that get in our own way. And I like to call that cultural sludge. So if you wanna try the six meeting method, I suggest starting with something lower risk and smaller in scope, get, get a couple, three projects underneath your belt make the defined deliverables for each and every meeting a complete expectation, right? We're not gonna give on that, that that has to happen. I have used this in a train the trainer model where we've trained frontline staff who have led projects with this six meeting uh, method. Um, I think engaging the leader is also important. So let them know what you're doing. And also for leadership, highlight what I like to call the meta improvements. Just by implementing this method and being consistent, you're gonna have better accountability. You're gonna end up with rapid adoption of change. You're gonna engage the front line. Um, that is what comes along with this in addition to actually working on the specific improvement itself. So that is a quick overview of the six meetings. Um, I think one of the things it does is really causes us to question the way we normally approach improvements. What are the things we keep doing that get in our own way? And how can we maybe totally rethink about that? I love this quote by Miles Monroe, which is, you will never change anything that you're willing to tolerate. And sometimes in healthcare, I think we tolerate things sometimes without really questioning, you know, is that really what we should be doing? So, I really encourage you to think about this. Um, the tools are there for you to use and modify, make it uh, work for your own institution. And I hope you really enjoyed this, this presentation and you give this approach a try. So with that, I wanna just thank everyone for being part of the presentation today. My contact information right here um, is right here. I'm glad to answer any follow-up questions you might have. So feel free to send me an email and glad to give you a little bit more instruction or some assistance if you need it. So thanks again, everyone, and good luck with your improvements.